Today we're in Westford, Massachusetts at a super energy efficient house built by Habitat for Humanity and designed by Building Science Corporation. We've got Betsy Pettit, president of Building Science Corporation and a fellow with AIA to here to tell us about a little bit about what makes this project so special. So Betsy, tell me a little bit about what makes this house particularly green. Well, Building Science Corporation, we really think that uh, what makes a house green is a house that provides for long-term durability, long-term energy efficiency, and provides a good indoor environment for the people to live in. Right now, we are poised to get a LEED Platinum rating for this home. This is unusual because this house will achieve that rating without having any site-generated energy. This means that it's going to be the most affordable LEED Platinum house, we hope, that's been built in the country so far. And we know that's really important for Habitat for Humanity homeowners because the operating expenses are going to be a large part of you know, their exposure to, uh, to cost. But So let's move to the first aspect of that. You said that there's no renewable site energy on the site, so that means that this building's got to be really, really top performance with energy efficiency. That's right. The enclosure design is really special on this house. We've done a lot of things that are different. So that while you look at the house and it looks like a typical New England Cape, in fact it has insulation values well beyond any of the R values that you would find typically today in New England. Um, for instance, we have four inches of foil face polyisocyanurate foam on the outside of the house and four inches of polyisocyanurate foam on top of the roof deck. We, that rigid foam on the outside is in addition to the foam that's going to go in the cavities. The walls are R45, the roof is R62 when we finish. The basement will also have high R values. The floor will be R10 and the walls will be R26. And those are well above what are, is considered even standards for energy efficiency today, correct? That, that's correct. So we're about a 50% improvement over the required insulation values that the International Energy Conservation Code is requiring today in our climate. So Betsy, you told us about the R values on the walls and the ceiling, but I understand that it's how all of these connect. Can you show us how you've made sure that there's a continuous protection on heat loss in this house? Sure. We have basically a continuous thermal insulation system and air barrier system, and I can show you quickly with a diagram in the sand oh, here. Oh, great. This house is basically a box with a gable roof, in a basement. Typically the insulation would be only protecting the inside of the box right, and right. it would be in the cavities uh, of, the, of the structural framing. In this particular house what we've done is we put insulation, we've wrapped it all the way around the outside walls, up over the roof, back down over the eaves and back down to where the foundation starts. We've also added extra insulation inside the foundation walls in the basement, as well as under the slab. So what we have here is really a single-family house that's being built with what we call the ideal wall. We have more than half the insulation to the outside of the structure, and it's all protected. It's like having a blanket uh, warm your house for the whole season. And some of the areas where you have the most trouble, like where the top of the wall meets the roof, at the rim joist of the house, you have continuous insulation and air barriers there as well. That's correct. And so the outside insulation connects through uh, at the bottom plates uh, through to the inside insulation. And up at the eave, the outside insulation connects through the soffits up to the roof deck. Now, Betsy, if we're going to control energy with this much intensity, we got to make sure that we keep the house from rotting. We got to make sure that we uh, take care of water management as well, right? Yes, that's correct. And so what happens is that this insulating sheathing, the foil face foam, is one of our favorites because the outside face of that can also become what we call the drainage plane. What we've done here is provide the insulation on the outside and we tape all the seams that happen between the foam joints. It allows us to, to uh, add our flashings around our windows and integrate them into what is the drainage plane, which is the foil face of this building. On, on the outside of that, we've added furring strips so that we can add our siding to it, and that's going to allow our siding to last very long. So this is all part of the long-term durability plan for this building. The windows are then attached with tape. The openings are flashed with um, a water-resistive barrier, um, and that is attached to the foam. 
and now we have a consistent drainage plane for the water to, to drain off the siding. So the cladding will be attached to these furring strips, and that'll block a lot of the moisture the wall sees, but behind that we have this, this second line of defense, right? That's right. So we have a, an airspace, and that will allow us, you can see at the bottom, we've allowed this airspace to stay open. We've put a screening at the bottom of the walls, and beyond this there's a drainage mat, so it'll allow any water that might get behind the siding to drain out. But we also have a space with this furring strip that's going to allow air to circulate behind the siding and keep that siding dry. So we never have a situation where we have flat wood against flat sheathing that really um, uh, would encourage for the water to stay there and not dry and then allow wood and, and sheathings to rot. So Betsy, we got four inches of foam on the outside of the wall. The real problem is going to come with penetrations like a window. Tell us a little bit how you handled that. Okay. Well, first of all, we needed to make up for the extra depth that the four inches of insulating sheathing adds to the wall. So we've created a plywood box around the opening. In order to structurally attach the window, we, we use these straps. These straps are screwed into the jam of the window, and then they're screwed into the plywood box that we've made. The flange of the window is still on the outside face of the foam sheathing, but it now acts as the flashing for the window that allows us to then put our water-resistive barrier tape over it and counter flash and make that window watertight as well as airtight. You've got four inches of foam on the outside of the wall. How did you get your shear? What we used was uh, a, a method where we put um, shear walls in the corners and every 25 foot on center. And this is allowed by the code, so we can see that we have a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood in each corner of this building. And if we go, went all the way around the house, you'd see that every corner has this configuration. You can see we've also created a two-stud corner, uh, meaning that we actually have room to put insulation within that cavity as we get to the corner. And we've also got the drywall clips up here that are going to allow us to attach our drywall without having a piece of wood just for drywall attachment. And corners are tough spots because they're, they're, that's a transition too, right? That's, a, that's right, and that's where we can get a lot of cold areas. And if we have an area that's always cold in the uh, wintertime in a house, you can actually get condensation and grow mold in the corners. We've got the threaded rod in this assembly uh, in order to help us connect the rafters at the roof all the way down to the foundation. Betsy, tell us what's special about this wall. Okay, well one of the things that's special is that we created a wall with what we call advanced framing. You can see there's a single top plate. We're very careful about every set in the wall. Again, through design we drew the walls and we said this is where we want them. So what we've done is we've made sure we have a lot of clear area where we can fill that wall cavity with insulation. In this case, what you're seeing is a loose insulation. It's behind plexiglass for us to see for a demonstration. But it's a loose blown insulation and it's going to clearly fill all the voids in this wall. We could really use any kind of insulation in this system um, because we've, again, we've got forgiveness built in because we have a lot of insulating sheathing on the outside. But really, any loose blown insulation is going to give you better performance than a bat that is that has to be cut to try to fill this void. So Betsy, clearly we're in the basement. You decided to put the insulation on the inside. Tell us a little bit about that choice. Well, we decided to put it on the inside for ourselves because we, um, we wanted to get a continuous insulation barrier. In our case, we've put in two inches of R10 XPS insulation under the slab. We've put some polyethylene on top of it and we're ready to pour the slab. On the walls, we used uh, furring strips that were shot into the concrete. And then we uh, attached to the furring strips through these big washers uh, two two-inch layers of foil face polyisocyanurate, similar to what we did on the outside of the building. So above this wall, we have uh, R26 on the outside face of the walls. As we get into the basement, we have R26 on the inside faces of the walls. So Betsy, you can build a really tight house, you just got to be careful about controlling the things that could threaten human health. That's right. So here we've got a soil, gas, and radon vent system that'll help any um, polluting sources that might be coming from below grade escape through the roof. We've also got a sump pump in here. The furring strips that we put on the wall and the interior perimeter drain will, will allow us to collect any water that might 
come through the foundation wall through imperfections. That water will flow directly into the perimeter drain uh, around inside face of the, so of the wall here. So a belt and suspenders here. approach. Exactly. And if, if there is there ever any water, um, the sump pump will be able to pump it out. We, of course, backfilled with a free-flowing backfill. Uh, the site was, is very sandy here, so it drains quite well. So we have all kinds of approaches to make sure that this basement is kept warm and dry and leak-free. I know one of the tough things in getting high performance with design is figuring out where, where to put all the ducts. Tell us a little bit about your duct design for this house. Okay. Well, one of the advantages about getting all the insulation on the outside and making sure that we have all of the enclosure and our air tightness happening from the outside of the enclosure is that now all our ducts are inside the conditioned space. So this house was designed to have the ducts all be distributed inside. And for instance, here's an, a duct chase that's going to take um, one of the uh, risers up to this one, the bedroom directly above here. And it, you can see it's well within the conditioned space. We made sure that nobody by mistake was going to put a duct in the outside wall where we're reserving for insulation. This riser is going to happen inside the building, and that's exactly where we want it. And so, Betsy, we've talked about the insulation in the wall, but we have spray foam at the base of the wall as well. Right, that's to help promote air tightness for this wall, and we're trying to make sure that the sheathing is attached in an airtight manner to the outside face of the stud. So we've actually taken foam, and the volunteers have done a good job of blowing the foam at the locations at the interface of the exterior sheathing to the inside uh, uh, face of the stud. So we got the transitions. It's the margins of the walls and the transitions around the windows and all. That's where the where you have to make sure you do the excellent job. That's correct. Seems to me like the Habitat homeowners are going to get pretty good utility bills out of this. They're going to have a low energy bill, a low maintenance bill, and good indoor air quality. And that's got to be done through design, right? That's right. That's the only way to get it done right. Excellent.